So welcome to presentation on ratio analysis. This is going to be long, um, we'll see if I have to cut it in two. So ratios examine the relationship between various components of the balance sheet and the income statement. They, uh, they're used to compare a company over time and as well to the industry. There are five major categories, liquidity, solvency or leverage, activity or efficiency, profitability and market value ratios. So activity ratios measure the efficiency of day-to-day -day tasks uh, of, the of the company. Liquidity ratios are uh, measuring the ability to meet short-term financial uh, obligations or liabilities. The solvency are long-term obligations we have profitability, that, that's the ability to generate profitable sales, of course, from an asset base and from the volume of sales as well. And the market value has to do with the, uh, the value from an ownership uh, claim point of view, so the value from an owner's uh, share point of view. So what's important is for in when you're doing ratio analysis has it ha depends on the company's goals and strategy so if a company is has a has a strategic plan that requires growth in a new business which uh, will not be profitable for the first next couple of years obviously the values will look different than if a company is trying to consolidate there are industry normal issues so ratios are always industry specific actually um, if you have multiple lines of business, that makes it very difficult to compare because the aggregated ratios are a mix of, ratio of, of the ratios based on the mix of the business. And accounting methods may differ. Economic conditions, of course, are, are also important. So cyclical businesses, which will have a uh, different type of value at the different points in the, s in the cycle. And of course, the stage of the business um, in that cycle. So ana ratio analysis, however, does allow for the consistent comparison of a business over time as well as between businesses. And it, and it converts the no dollar amount to a common uh, standardized number. So if uh, in general, if you have only income statement items or only balance sheet items, then you can use the values of a current income statement or the current balance sheet. But if you have a mixed uh, ratio, so using both the income statement and the balance sheet, the value of the current income statement and the average value of the balance sheet item is used. Now, I don't normally uh, require that for the introductory accounting and finance classes, but um, the reasoning behind it is that the, in the balance, the income statement goes over the duration of a year, and so you want to have the averaged values of the asset va uh, items over that year. So that's why we average the two, uh, the two balance sheet values. So the liquidity ratios, we're going to start off with the current ratio. That's the relationship between current assets and current liabilities as they are on the balance sheet. So the current ratio itself is current assets over current li liabilities. Now the quick ratio is looking at the current assets which can be converted into cash the most quickly. That would be cash and short-term marketable securities or cash equivalents and accounts receivable. Uh, basically what's been removed is inventory, uh, prepayments as well, because they cannot be converted into cash that quickly. In the case of prepayments, they can't be because, for example, prepaid rent, you can't get the money back. And in the case of inventory, it takes the longest to become cash because it has to first be sold and become receivables. The cash ratio is the most strictest and limited version. That's basically cash and the cash equivalents over current liabilities. Solvency or leverage ratios. We have debt to equity. That's total debt. Now, total debt is actually measured as total liability. So that would be total assets minus owner's equity or total equity. So we divide that by then by total equity. Debts to total assets would again be total debt or total liabilities over assets. Long-term capitalization ratio is sometimes used. That is the long-term debt over the total long-term capital, that being long-term debt plus equity. We have equity multiplier. That's the total assets over total equity. And 
Now we have uh, the times interest earned ratio is measuring the capacity of uh, to pay the interest and that's the earnings before interest and tax which is a line item right above the interest uh, divided by the interest expense. Now fixed charge coverage uh, is looking at the total fixed charge so it's not just interest as we see here it also includes capital payments so in other words um, what has to be paid back from the loan or the, uh, the original loan amount as well as lease payments um, and so those are the fixed charges and then we what we do is we take the earnings before interest and tax and of course we add back the lease payments and the capital payments because those are already uh, have already been removed in the earnings before interest and tax so that gives us a fixed charge coverage now the activity or efficiency ratios are look uh, we have the accounts receivables turnover that measures how many times you're turning over the accounts receivable so it's credit sales which is connected to it divided by accounts receivable accounts payable turnover is, is uh, purchases on credit divided by accounts payable inventory turnover is cost of goods sold divided by inventory level working capital turnover ratio is revenue or sales divided by working capital now the first three or all of them actually whatever you're turning over you'll notice is always in the denominator working capital inventory accounts payable accounts receivable and especially with the first three you'll notice what you have as a numerator is the what causes or what's connected to the, d the denominator so what creates an accounts receivable the credit sale what it creates a, a, a payable is a purchase on credit what it creates the inventory or reduces the inventory levels that would be the cost of goods sold when you make a sale now the working capital turnover ratio is a little bit different that's like the total asset turnover which we're going to run into later anyway but basically whatever's in the uh, turn the whatever it's called and being turned over turned over is then in the denominator now uh, working capital is simply the current assets minus current liabilities it's not a ratio but it's often calculated within the context of ratio analysis now the days connected to, uh, so the day sales outstanding or days of receivables days of inventory on hand days of payable are connected to the turnover ratios and all these days are calculated by taking 365 so the number of days a year and dividing by the number the turnover number so 365 over receivables turnover, 365 over inventory turnover, 365 over payables turnover. To make it clear, imagine if we had a uh, receivables turnover of 12, then 365 over 12 would be about a month, and that would make sense. If I have, if I'm turning over my receivables or anything 12 times a year, then that means that's with every month is about the time. So that's why we calculate it this way, or that's the common sense behind it. Another concept here we have is operating cycle. Now, if we consider the vertical as uh, time from top to bottom, the activity is that if you're in an operating, if you're in a manufacturing business, you'll have raw materials arriving, the production is complete, and eventually cost goods are sold. Now, we can even skip the first part if we only have, if we have uh, merchandise or we'll have materials arriving and goods are sold. But in any case, these activities are all part of the days of inventory that are calculated as such as well. And then eventually the cash is collected from the customer. That part is the days receivable. If you look at these two together, that's called the operating cycle. So the operating cycle is the amount of time in days between raw materials arriving or ma whatever the materials arriving and then the cash finally collected from the making the sale. So that operating cycle is the days of inventory plus the days receivable. Now the cash con converse conversion cycle is also considering the fact that when the raw materials arrive, we don't have to pay. So, th so the time, the entire operating cycle is not the, the time that we need to finance in terms of payment because we, there's a delay between when the materials arrive and when we pay our supplier. That delay is the days payable. So the cash conversion cycle, which is the time between when we actually make our payment to the supplier and when we receive money from our customers, 
is the operating cycle minus the days of pay days payable. Now, profitability ratios are important and they measure the performance and earnings effectiveness. Now, the return on assets is looking at the profit, net income over average total assets. I just recall the fact that I didn't always have the averages on the um, on the uh, previous slides for the activity ratios because they're also using something from the income statement and from the balance sheet. But keep that in mind as well, please. So net income over average total assets, net income of aver over average equity, and net income over revenues for the profit margin. Also sometimes called return on sales. Now market value ratios, we have the uh, earnings per share, uh, which is simply the net income over weighted average of shares that are outstanding. So the total earnings over total shares, but it's weighted average for the year. And the price earnings ratio then is using the earnings per share. So we have the share price or the stock price divided by the earnings per share. Now the payout ratio would be the dividends that the, that the shareholders receive divided by the net income. So it's the proportion of income that goes to dividends. The retention ratio is the, uh, is the addition to the retained earnings over the net income, which is what's left behind when we've paid the dividends. So it's really retention ratio is one minus the payout ratio. Continuing on, we have price to cash flow. That's a price per share over cash flow per share. Price to sales, as you can see, price to per share to sales to per share. Price to book value would be price per share over book value per share. EBITDA, that's used a lot in valuations. That's earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. That divided by the average number of shares. And what I slid in here, which could have gone actually above, price earnings growth or a PEG, PEG ratio, that would be the price earnings ratio divided by the growth rate measured as a percentage. So 4.3%, you would have 4.3. Now cash flow ratios are also used. They're used often to in analyze debt service capacity and private equity analysis. And these are some that, that, w that we are, are typically used. I'm going to go through them quickly because there are so many, it's not even an exhaustive overview of the potential ratios. We have cash flow to revenue, cash return on assets, cash return on equity, cash to income, cash flow per share, and um, cash CFO stands for cash flow from operations and um, that can be seen in the uh, cash flow statement. Then we have debt coverage, which is cash flow to debt, interest coverage, reinvestment, debt payment, dividend payment. So you can see, depending on what you're looking for, you can also look at the cash flow analysis for some information. Here we have the debt payment, which is cash flow divided by the cash paid for debt for long-term debt payment, dividend payment, investing and financing. Then we have credit analysis ratios. Now credit analysis uses a lot of ratios and every credit analysis um, bank and uh, credit agency uses them slightly differently. But here are common ones we have, we're looking at EBIT over capital, EBIT over interest, gross interest, EBIT over uh, EBITDA over gross interest, and total debt over EBITDA. So, so as you see, many different types of ratios. So fu free funds to oper from operations to total debt, those are netting, that's net income adjusted for non-cash items over total debt, CFO minus capital expenditures to total debt. We have uh, EBITDA over gross interest, so very many things are involved and very commonly and importantly, adjustments are made for off sheet uh, balance, off balance sheet debt. So there are many other ratios and they often depend on the user of the ratio. So is it a creditor, is it a shareholder, is it a supplier that's analyzing? And, some, and often they depend on the type of industry 
in, which makes the, the one ratio more important than another. Now, each industry has specific ratios. This is a, just a quick overview of a couple of them. So the financial sec sector has particularly important ones. So banks have capital adequacy ratios where they measure something called risk-weighted assets and uh, they calculate with market risk exposure and uh, level of operational risk uh, is assumed. And you have different types of capital. You have monetary reserve requirements, liquid asset requirements, and net interest margin, which is a difference between in the, the, which is the interest income over the interest earning assets. And then we have, in retail, we have s same store sales as an example, or sales per square meter or square foot. For hotels, we have average daily rate, uh, occupancy rate. These are very important. So that's a quick, quick overview of ratios. Hopefully that helped, and thank you for your attention.